Just a reminder to our Speculating Wildly About Crime listeners, this is for entertainment purposes only and solely the thoughts and opinions of our team. We do invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, you guys, and welcome to an all-new episode of Speculating Wildly About Crime. As you'll notice, we're doing things a little bit differently in today's episode. In fact, I will be covering a case that I covered on my own podcast, a podcast called This Story is Nuts. It's the case of Lorene Ron, and it's a case that has bothered me ever since I started researching it years ago. Even though we're changing up our format for today's episode, we really want you, the listeners, to speculate along with us. So, at the end of today's episode, please leave a comment on what you think happened to Lorraine. Your comments and speculations might actually make it onto our show when we then again revisit the case of Lorraine Ron and talk about what we think happened. So stay tuned for that future episode. All right, you guys, let's get into this story and speculate wildly together. Lorraine Ron convinced her mom, Judith, to go to the tennis game without her. You see, it was the first day of the 14-year-old's spring break, and she wasn't old enough to stay home alone. She would spend her day being visited by family members, seen restocking wine coolers at a nearby convenience center, and hanging with a male and female friend, drinking some beers. By the time Lorene's mom returned home, however, Lorene would be gone, leaving everything she owned behind. But Lorene wouldn't be gone without a trace. You see, there would be mysterious phone calls made to Judith in the middle of the night and reported sightings. At first, authorities believed that Lorraine might be a runaway. But soon, new details emerge that quickly change their minds. Today, we talk about the case of what actually happened to Lorraine Ron. Hi, I'm your host, Missy, and I'm about to take you on a wild ride. Stories with plot twists, shocking endings, and unbelievable truths. Trust me when I tell you that this story is nuts. Ron and her mother Judith lived in Manchester, New Hampshire. 14 year old Lorraine had been raised by her mother after Judith and her father got divorced when she was just an infant. And the two were close. Judith adored her daughter Lorraine, a bright student in school who loved to sing and dance and had dreams of someday becoming an actress. On April 26, 1980, Judith would make plans to go out of town and watch her boyfriend, who was a professional tennis player, compete in a match. Lorraine, who normally would tag along, asked her mother that day if she could instead stay home, and Judith would say it was okay. Several family members of Lorraine's would stop by the two-bedroom apartment on Merrimack Street to visit with Lorraine, and others would recall seeing Lorraine restocking wine coolers at the Rosebud Suprette, a local convenience store, which may or may not be where Lorraine was able to pick up a six-pack of beer and some wine that she would later share with some friends. Now, just a note about the friends. Now, we know for sure that there were two friends, a male and a female friend, but there was some speculation and um, it was never directly proven that there might have been a third male friend. Now, one of the friends that we do know of was the male and he was between the ages of 15 and 21 and the other one was, it just says female friend, And we don't have any of their names or any information about them. So in this podcast, we will just say either the male friend or the female friend here. Now, sometime around 1230 a.m., voices were heard outside of the Ron apartment. And the male friend was afraid that Judith and her boyfriend were returning home and that he would get in trouble for being there. So he decided to leave out the back door of the apartment, later claiming that he heard Lorraine lock the door behind him. At around 1.15 a.m. on the morning of April 27, 1980, 
Judith, Ron, and her boyfriend make their way back toward Judith and Lorraine's apartment, noticing that every light bulb on the way up to the third floor is dark. Every light bulb was actually unscrewed. Judith didn't know this at the time, and I just want you to pay attention to that, that every light bulb was unscrewed here. Once the two reached the apartment, they also noticed that the front door was unlocked, though the Rons usually locked their doors. Once inside, Judith would peer into her daughter's bedroom. Seeing a figure on the bed, she quickly assumed her daughter was asleep and safe. But Judith's boyfriend would quickly call her to alert her that the back door, and now this was the door that the male friend had sworn that Lorraine had locked, was left wide open. Immediately, Judith went to go ask her daughter why the door was left open, only to find that the figure sleeping in her daughter's bed was not Lorene, but her female friend, who was not quite sober and was confused. And she told Judith that Lorene was sleeping on the couch. Despite her blanket and pillow still being on the couch, Lorene Ron wasn't. She was gone. Now, in a panic, Judith would begin to call friends and family members, hoping that maybe Lorreen was with one of them. When the answer was no, Judith and her boyfriend left the apartment to go search the streets, hoping to find Lorene. At 3.45 a.m., Judith would spot an on-duty police officer and flag them down to report her daughter missing. Now, officers quickly questioned Lorene's female friend who was still in the apartment, but unfortunately, she claims that she cannot remember anything that happened that night because she had been drinking. Quickly, investigators start to speculate that maybe Loreen had been a runaway, especially after they find out that the morning of April 26th, her and her mom had gotten into a fight. However, with some further investigation, they drop this theory quite quickly. And that's because they discover that nothing had been taken from the house. Not a single thing. That's Lorraine's clothes, her purse, and even the brand new shoes that she had begged for for her birthday, which had been earlier that month. They still sat in the apartment unmoved. Authorities were starting to believe that maybe Lorraine had left her home on purpose with the intention of returning, and then something had happened to her after she left. In the initial investigation, they also spoke to a bus company employee who had told them that he had sold a bus ticket to a girl who'd look like Lorene. And when they also talked to the bus driver, he ID'd an old photo of Lorene, stating that she was the girl he had previously dropped off in Park Square, Boston. But when authorities came back a few weeks later with a more recent photo of Lorene, the same bus driver could no longer say whether the girl was Lorene or not, and the lead quickly dried up. Now, Judith would not give up on her daughter despite the case going quickly cold. She would plaster missing person photos anywhere she could and would continue to try to keep the case alive. In October of 1980, Judith Ron would notice something strange on her phone bill. Judith, who did not have any friends or family in California, noticed that there were three phone calls charged on her account that she did not make. Two calls were from a motel in Santa Monica and one call from a motel in Santa Ana to a teen sexual assistance hotline. So it was a hotline number that was maintained by a doctor to answer any questions teens had about sex. Okay, so I'm going to do my very best to try to explain this next part. But you see, in the 1980s, people were able to make collect phone calls to a location and then could charge the calls to an account if they had one. So either the person with the account would have to get permission by the phone operator or the person calling would need a PIN number that would work as a form of an agreement. So let's say Lorene really did want to make a collect phone call, and she would either have to call the phone operator, and then that phone operator would have to get permission from the account holder, which would be Judith, or she would just have to know the PIN number that Judith had in order to charge that call to the account. Hopefully that makes some sense. When detectives spoke to the physician who maintained the hotline, he denied knowing anything about the phone calls. However, five years later, the man would change his story after an investigator with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children called him, now admitting that young women and runaways would often visit the home that he and his wife shared and that one of the girls might have actually been Lorraine. 
according to the man. A former porn star and sex educator named Annie Sprinkles knew his wife and she might be able to give authorities more information about Lorraine. However, when investigators interviewed Annie Sprinkles, she denied even knowing the doctor's wife. In 1986, this same investigator would travel to California and visit the motels that the phone calls had been made out of. She would discover that one of these same motels might have actually been used, and here's a trigger warning, you guys, as a filming location for a child porn director named Dr. Z. A connection could not be made between the hotline and Dr. Z, and yet again, nothing came from this lead. After the disappearance of Lorene, Judith never gave up hope that her daughter was alive, and she even believed that her daughter was behind anonymous phone calls that were made starting in 1981, all the way until Judith changed her number several years later. The calls would happen almost always around 3.45 a.m., ramping up especially around Christmas time, and the caller would sit silently on the other end of the line. Now, Judith wasn't the only one receiving strange phone calls either. Janet Roy, Lorene's aunt, would also receive several phone calls from a young woman who would ask for her son, which was Lorene's favorite cousin, Michael. The caller would ask for Mike, which is what Lorene had called him, and then would sit silently on the phone. Another call would be made to a friend of Lorene's as well. Although the friend wasn't home at the time of the call, his mother would state that the call was from either a Lori or a Lorraine. Police never looked into the phone calls because the calls never actually made it into their reports. Whether the calls were hoaxes or really Lorraine, no one can really say. Apparent sightings of Lorene were also reported from a Boston bus terminal, and another sighting of her was made in Anchorage, Alaska in 1988, working as a sex worker. However, none of these sightings were confirmed. Judith never gave up hope that her daughter was alive and believes that the phone calls she received were truly from her daughter, though she couldn't understand how her daughter could call her and not ever say anything, since they had such a close relationship. She believed that maybe someone had forced her daughter out of the apartment and maybe they did something to her to make her lose her memory. Authorities in the case had a different theory, though believing that whatever happened to Lorraine, foul play was definitely involved. One thing is for certain, though. Lorraine Ron's disappearance wasn't the first in the span of only a few months in the exact same area. Just a month before Lorraine's disappearance, a 15-year-old girl named Rachel Elizabeth Garden disappeared from Newton, New Hampshire, which is located 35 miles north of Manchester. Rachel had been hanging out at her local convenience store on March 22, 1980, and she had visited the store to purchase gum and a pack of cigarettes. Rachel had said she was going to a friend's house for a sleepover, but the friend later on said she had no idea what Rachel was talking about here. Witnesses claim that they saw Rachel talking to three men in a car that night, and the men all were known to have trouble with the law one of them later being arrested for assault and rape. Although no connection was ever made between the two girls, they were both around the same age and build, and some said that they looked quite similar. Rachel was considered a runaway, and she was never found. Six weeks after Lorene's disappearance, Denise Ann Denault, and I hope that I'm saying that name right, a 25-year-old single mother who lived only two blocks from Lorene Ron disappeared at around 1.30 a.m. on June 8th. She had been drinking at the Merrimack Club and was planning on heading to a party shortly after. Like the other two girls, Denise was also never found, and despite her age difference, she also bore a striking resemblance to Lorene as well. In Denise's case, it is speculated that she was possibly murdered by suspected serial killer Terry Peter Rasmussen, who had been living in the area under the name Bob Evans. Terry Rasmussen had been convicted of killing his wife in California in 2003, but authorities also believe he's responsible for the deaths and or disappearances for at least six other women, such as the case of the Bear Brook murders, which refers to four female murder victims who were found in Bear Brook State Park between 1985 and 2000, one of the victims actually being Rasmussen's own biological daughter. Rasmussen died in 2010 while serving a life sentence. 
There has not been a definitive link between these cases, despite the coincidences. And in fact, police did have their eye on a suspect in Lorraine's case, a 35-year-old man who lived close to Lorraine's apartment. The man, whose name has never been released, was known to invite young girls into his apartment with the promise of beer. He was also found to be in possession of child porn. Yet again, no link between the disappearance of Lorene and this unknown man were ever made. Lorene Ron's case has never been solved, and though she has been missing for over 40 years now, her mother Judith never gave up hope in the search for her daughter. Whether it was pressing for answers from authorities or consulting psychics, she firmly believed that her daughter made the phone calls to her in the 1980s. She eventually remarried and moved to Florida. Lorene Ron's male friend who was at her home the night of her disappearance took his own life in 1985, stating, I can't take it anymore. He was never considered a suspect by police. If you have any information on what happened to Lorene Ron, please call the Manchester Police Department at 603-668-8711. Once again, you guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in to this extra special episode of Speculating Wildly About Crime, featuring a case from this story is nuts. Stay tuned for a future episode where we actually discuss this case as a group and get into our speculations of what we think happened in this case. You can find This Story is Nuts as well as Speculating Wildly About Crime on all of the socials. But Speculating Wildly About Crime you can also find on YouTube if you're more of a visual person. To reach out to us with either your speculations or with story suggestions, please send your emails at swackpod, that's S-W-A-C pod, at gmail.com. Or you can also reach out to me at thisstoryisnuts at gmail.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our show today. We ask you to please subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else that you find your favorite podcasts, just so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at SWACPOD, S-W-A-C-P-O-D, or you can contact us via email for questions, comments, or case ideas. Our email address is swackpod at gmail.com. That's S-W-A-C-P-O-D at gmail.com. Thanks so much for speculating wildly with us tonight.